Thank you for joining us at this hour. I'm Daniel Che for this Sunday's edition of Adirang News. We begin with the continued efforts in Jindo. Nearly one month has passed. 29 people still remain unaccounted for in the Sewaro ferry disaster. Search teams are finding it increasingly more difficult to find them. Poor weather conditions this weekend have kept divers out of the waters and is forcing authorities to consider new options. Our Kim ji starts us off. Search efforts on the sunken Seroho ferry entered their 26th day on Sunday, but poor weather conditions continue to hamper progress. A heavy wind watch was issued on Sunday morning in waters off of Korea's southwestern coast, which includes the accident site. It's the latest setback for divers tasked with searching inside the ferry, who have been kept out of the water since the wee hours of Saturday morning. In their place, around 20 submarine ships using sonar radars are conducting most of the searches looking for bodies that may have been swept out of the ferry. The emergency headquarters says it is trying to come up with a better plan to search inside the vessel as it started to collapse and is putting divers in danger. Prime Minister Chung Won Won visited the ferry site on Sunday afternoon. He vowed to provide special aid to the residents of Chindo Island who have helped with the search and rescue efforts at the expense of their own livelihoods. Investigations into the ferry sinking also continue. Prosecutors have arrested a senior official of an inspection company on charges of negligence. They say the inspector provided a false report on the condition of the ferry's lifeboats. The official in question submitted a report to the Korean Register of Shipping saying that equipment in 17 categories on the Seoho ferry was in good condition, but only one out of 44 lifeboats deployed when the ferry began listing. Prosecutors are also zeroing in on the de facto owner of the ferry operator, Yu byung on and his family to determine whether there were any business irregularities that could have led to the ferry sinking. Yu's brother appeared for questioning on Sunday. He was paid monthly expenses of more than 2,000 U.S. dollars in business consultation fees by Chongyajin Marine Company, the operator of the Sero Hole. It represents the first time a family member of Yu's has shown up for questioning. Yu's eldest son has been summoned to appear on Monday. Kim ji Arirang News. Rival political parties have agreed to convene an extraordinary parliamentary session to discuss follow-up measures to the ferry sinking. Flow leaders Yi Wan Gu of the ruling Henry Party and Park Young Sun of the New Politics Alliance for Democracy agreed to open a plenary session and activate standing committees this week. The parties, however, disagreed on other matters surrounding the issue. Opposition lawmakers want a parliamentary probe and a special prosecutor to be appointed for the investigation. The ruling party, meanwhile, has expressed reservations about both requests. President Park geun is expected to make a public statement to the nation this week on the Sewaro ferry disaster, and it contains a master plan to boost public safety. Now, despite evidence that says otherwise, North Korea is denying it sent the three drones found on South Korean soil earlier this year. A spokesperson for the North's National Defense Commission says they had no hand in dispatching the unmanned aerial vehicles, that Seoul had fabricated the evidence to pin the blame on Pyongyang. The North described the act as a heinous farce designed by South Korea's government to divert attention from the Sewaro ferry disaster. A joint South Korea-U.S. investigation concluded last week that three drones found crashed in the South in late March and early April had been programmed to depart from the north and return. They took hundreds of pictures of key military and government facilities, and the north is believed to have flown dozens more back and forth across the border that went undetected. The chief of Korea's largest conglomerate has been hospitalized. Samsung chairman Lee Gun Hee was admitted late Saturday night local time after having difficulty breathing and underwent an emergency medical procedure on Sunday after showing symptoms of heart failure. According to company officials, the 72-year-old is now in stable condition. The chairman has a history of respiratory problems. He had surgery for lung cancer back in 1999 and was hospitalized last summer with symptoms of light pneumonia. Egani's latest health problems come after recent moves to promote his children to top positions. 
Yi's son, Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman Jae Yi Lee, is expected to eventually succeed him. It's been nearly a month now since some 300 girls were kidnapped from their boarding school in Nigeria, and still no one knows where they are. Under fire is Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan, who is blamed for not doing enough to secure the release from the militant Islamist group Boko Haram. A chorus of condemnation is now raining down on the Nigerian government, starting from within the country. Nigerians stage a daily protest for the 11th day in the capital Saturday, calling for more to be done. The international community has stepped in, with the U.S. and Britain having sent specialized personnel for the search. But experts believe the girls may have already been separated into smaller groups and moved to neighboring countries, making the search even more challenging. And despite warnings from the West and a plea for a postponement from Moscow, pro-Russian separatists in the east of Ukraine are holding referendums this Sunday, asking voters whether they support a declaration of independence from Ukraine. Or Hwang Jihe reports. The controversial secession vote was pushed ahead by pro-Russian separatists in two of the most tense regions in eastern Ukraine on Sunday, despite calls by Russian President Vladimir Putin to postpone it. The referendums are similar to the one in Crimea in March that approved secession from Ukraine. Crimea was formally annexed by Russia soon thereafter. The referendums in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions will ask residents a simple yes or no question about whether they support the act of independence. Ballot papers were printed for over three million residents who have the right to vote. The secretary of the Luhansk Electoral Commission, whose full name was not given, expressed confidence about the process. We would like to invite different media groups and reporters to cover the referendum. The Central Electoral Commission has hotlines and we will report the polling situation every two hours. Besides, there will be supervisors outside each polling station. We will not have any limits anybody can supervise at a polling station. The vote comes despite warnings from Ukraine's acting president who called the ballot self-destructive and a step into the abyss for the regions. French President Francois Hollande and German Chancellor Angela Merkel also spoke out against the vote, saying the focus should be on Ukraine's nationwide election on May 25th. The two leaders agreed that if the nationwide vote does not take place, there will be consequences, including stronger sanctions against Russia. The United States added to the pressure, saying it will not recognize the illegal votes in eastern Ukraine while calling them an attempt to create further disorder. Huang Jie, Arirang News. Shifting to other stories, credit cards. It appears in Korea, people don't leave home without it. Among 18 countries recently surveyed by the Korea Financial Telecommunications and Clearings Institute, Korea came out on top in terms of credit card usage. The results showed that the average Korean consumer made around 150 purchases using credit cards in 2012. Canada was far behind in second place at, om at almost 90 purchases a year, and the U.S. in third at 83. The total credit card spending of Koreans ranked third in 2012, with each consumer spending around $8,600. Now, when you think of green energy, solar or wind power springs to mind. But generating electricity from raindrops that fall against a window or roof sounds pretty science fiction. And that's one method local researchers have come up with, and they say that's just the beginning of the technology's potential. Our Sun Jung In explains. A piece of glass substrate is connected to a small LED light bulb. When droplets of water fall one drop at a time onto the substrate, the bulb gives off a pale light. With the indoor lighting turned off, the flashing light, resembling that of a firefly, can be seen more easily. This time, the researchers use a shower faucet to sprinkle water onto the glass substrate. The bulb emits an even brighter light. The secret is a new advanced energy device that turns moving droplets into electric power. It alters the electrical characteristic of water drops, which makes the electrons inside move suddenly, generating electricity. Water that is normally neutral instantly becomes positively charged due to the device, which causes electrons to move. 
One single drop of water can create up to 0.42 milliwatts, which can light three to four LED bulbs at the same time. Researchers say the technology can be applicable to our daily lives. Using water that is wasted in kitchen or bathroom sinks could bring about a new assessment of the true value of water, literally making every drop count. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. In terms of weather, nationwide showers are expected here in Korea. In Jindu, unfortunately, strong winds and waves are expected to continue. And for weather conditions around the world, here they are. And that's all we have for you at this hour. For more, tune in at 10 p.m. Korea time. Thank you for watching.